from Barangaroo Studios, the AusBiz COB is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. Good afternoon. This is the COB. My name's Carl Rotter. I'm with Danny Akuye today. And uh, Danny, it looks like we're going to end on a positive note, it would seem. Indeed. ASX 200 have currently got up 23 points or three tenths of a percent to 7,300. Spot 4.0, but we'll wait and see how it closes out. SIBO 200 up three points or two tenths of a percent. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see they're edging higher. Let's just look at a couple of sectors that were well largely behind the move, at least uh, outperforming the rest of the market. We'll go into the details in a second because there's a lot of corporate news out today. A lot of that is captured in this uh, just little screen grab here. But uh, you can see CSL always helps when it's uh, moving higher. Cockley the same. You've just had a chat with the, the yeah. CEO, which we'll, we'll pick apart a little bit more in a, in a moment's time. Uh, really the only outlier there, Fisher & Piper. We've got another page actually here just in terms of the healthcare names. Uh, Prometicus also up on its earnings today. A really solid result actually. Mm. Tealix reports tomorrow if I'm not mistaken. Right. So um, again, a lot going on in there in terms of the healthcare space and uh, tech. Danny, another uh, area of the market that was yeah, performing well Yeah, it just today. seems to uh, catch the NASDAQ love. I mean, it was quite bizarre, really, because you had US 10-year Treasury real yields going up to 4.2%, and uh, NASDAQ, particularly NVIDIA, decided to take off like a Christmas cracker. Yeah, was it a, a broker upgrade with NVIDIA? Was I think, yeah, there's just ongoing uh, announcements, whether it's China buying in as much as they can, and then it was another, I can't remember, yes, it reports soon yeah. too. So, the uh, 23rd, be they report, which is 24th morning our time. One week away. Yeah. So uh, we'll steal ourselves maybe another 30% gain in, in half an hour. What do you reckon? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> I think some targets are around 500 US dollars. Interesting. Okay. Um, that's the tech index. Uh, let's go across uh, perhaps just the themes that we were looking at today. And well, it was a nice combination of macro and micro. Again, we will get to the micro in a second, mm. but um, well, Fresh cuts, that's uh, not my head. That is, in fact, to do with China's PBOC lowering its uh, medium-term uh, funding facility. Mm, uh, medium-term. By 25 medium. basis points. Yes, mm. try and get that out. Anyway, uh, so that seems to have uh, so, uh, supported market sentiment throughout the region. Uh, of course, we overlay that with the fact that there was some very weak data. Uh, very weak data. Mm. And really interesting. I mean, the size this 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 property com company that you cover, um, what's it called again? Co the, the latest one that's in trouble. Country Garden. Country Garden. That's yeah. it. I was going to go Coventry Garden, realizing it's not that. Um, yeah, it is really big, and it was meant to be the safest, the most financially secure, and, and they've defaulted. Mm. So there, you know, you wouldn't be wanting to hold all these U.S. De dollar denominated bonds that these property developers have issued because. Currently, they're trading six or seven cents in the dollar. Uh, I had a great chat, actually, a new guest today, uh, Greg Ng from Natixis mm. joined us. So if you are interested in just what's happening in China at the moment, provided a very interesting overview. Uh, but also locally, a lot of news. Uh, RBA minutes, well, always good to add a bit of colour there. But I think the news of the day was certainly that weaker than expected wage growth number, 3.6% for Indeed. the year. Indeed. And um, well, we'll talk a about it with our guests in a moment's time, but uh, perhaps offers a little bit more scope for the RBA to extend this pause, maybe even put the cue in the rack when it comes to rate hikes. We'll have to wait and see, of course. Um, but reports roll in. That's the third theme. And let's start rolling through them uh, now ourselves because CSL uh, was perhaps the one at the top of folks' yeah, radar today. it's really today. interesting, this one. So full year net profits down 3%. So you can see US $2.2 billion, underlying profit up 10% to US $2.6 billion. Revenue growth up 26%, up to US $13 billion. Final dividend, US $129 a share. Interesting, market really embraced it. They had downgraded earnings quite se severely beforehand, but you know they're still working on getting those uh, the bearing margins up. So they're getting the revenue growth, but as far as I could tell, it's going to take a while to see if margins ever go back to where they were pre-COVID. But nevertheless, market like the result. Yeah, and the share was down, what, what's it been, 40, 50 bucks from, from its highs a couple of months ago. So yeah. a lot of bad news kind of exactly. priced in, I guess. So a lot of people, about right, you know, a lot of probably momentum followers had dumped the shares, etc. Yeah. yeah, okay. So uh, bouncing today, uh, again, we'll keep an eye on that uh, when we look at leaders and laggards, see if it makes it to the list. But uh, Cochlear, 
I'll let you take this one away too because you just had a chat with, uh, I think it's Dig Howard. Is the yeah, CEO there? absolutely. So great result there. Net profits up 4% to 300 million. Revenue growth of 19% to 1.95 billion. Final dividend, $1.75. They did actually up the dividend. And uh, most of all, an upgrade in guidance to 355 to 375 million dollars. Really going along on all cylinders at the moment, this company. And, mm. uh, you know, he, he basically said costs were under control. They're investing very much for the future. They're going to be using, um, they have been using artificial intelligence. They're going to continue to do it in terms of helping the user experience for those people that have the cochlear implants. Mm. Um, and uh, really seeing just a very important study that hearing loss is associated with cognitive, cognitive decline over a period. So it's increasingly educational and awareness of people realising that not only is it not great not to be able to hear, but it actually contributes to dementia and cognitive, cognitive decline. That's really fascinating. So across the board, you know, good recoveries across all different geographic locations, um, slightly stronger uh, are they, the post-COVID uh, operations that were delayed, is what he said. Interesting. Okay, so Cochlear there was up today as well, up uh, yeah, 5%, 5 as we said, yep. saw before. Uh, Challenger, also good just to note what we saw there. Uh, profit up 13%. Uh, revenues are doubling to $2.5 billion. And it's, uh, well, final dividend to $0.12 cents per share. Guidance between 55 and 600 I would say that's pr probably 550 to $605 million next year. Uh, its shares were down throughout the day, however. Um, also, Treasury Wines, uh, another one that was in focus today. A slight drop in profits. Uh, revenues also declined to $2.5 billion. Did it manage to, uh, well, increase its dividend, $0.17 cents per share. So it's well positioned to deliver growth in FY24. I thought what was really interesting in terms of the tone of the guidance there was just discussing about the need to be nimble. Of, uh, of course, we saw some softness coming through their North American business, mm. uh, but China as well. Uh, there is some hope that maybe wine will be the next thing to see some reduced tariffs, tariffs. Uh, when mm. it comes to um, uh, uh, Aussie wine exports to China. Um, we'll have to see though. So they're going to have to be nimble there. Nevertheless, um, that was the results for Treasury Wine. Uh, but Danny Seek was maybe one of the disappointing results yeah, today. Um, its shares were down off the back of its results. Yeah, down almost 5%. And uh, it was it was slow down in uh, listings, isn't it? Effectively, yeah. but starting to hit. I, I haven't caught up totally there, and I nor did I catch up in terms of uh, those private investments they have because they've got that big private equity investment mm -hmm. portfolio oh, that yeah, they have. Yeah, yeah. Whether that had been downgraded. But um, yeah, so basically market didn't like this one and probably concurs slightly with what the RBA minutes were saying that they're seeing some softness in terms of the labour market, which one of my guests, Ronnie Green, was saying is that you're getting a lot more job applicants per job. Right. OK, so uh, some of that tightness being taken out of the labour market there, not necessarily good for seek. So, um Yes, stock was, was off for the day. Uh, 360. Now, did you talk to 360 as well today? Yes, I did. I did you put the idea about strapping things to stray animals? <laughs> no, I didn't get mm. to, get, didn't get to uh, that. That idea to But, like, day. really, the most important thing here is the fact that the company um, has become profitable. They can now have identifiable, reliable, predictable uh, recurring income, which, you know, all things being equal, should continue to lift the rating on the stock. Yeah, and I uh, heard uh, just, just bits and pieces of the interview because obviously we're busy working away in the newsroom, but just talking about the kind of adoption of millennials uh, in this product in particular and, well, more millennials are having, having kids. Babies, yeah. So um, there's, there's your um, potential growth uh, driver there. So it was up quite significantly. 15% at one stage. Yeah, there you go. So a really um, a positive result. But as we said, there's 12%. been a lot of macro and micro movers throughout the day. So to get across this, uh, it's all for us. Martin Crabb from Shore and Partners joins us now. Martin, great to have you back, of course. Uh, Good to be here. Uh, a little while, but it's, um, well, um, a lot's changed, a lot's happening, a lot's just happening simply today. Mm. Um, maybe we'll just start on uh, some of the developments locally in earnings season. Just overall, just your sense of how things are going at the moment. Yeah, hits and misses. I think the, the wheat's being separated from the chaff a little bit when mm. you look at uh, companies like Seek, which disappointed, you know, ResMed, which disappointed, um, just unable to pass on higher costs, right? In both of those businesses, cost of goods sold have just gone up through the roof like they have for a lot of businesses. And, you know, can they pass that on? And 
I think Seek really struggled. Their volumes were down 4% and their mm-hmm. yield, which is the price they charged, was only up 8 market was looking for up 12. So market thought, mm-hmm. well, these guys are clearly the leader in their space. They should be able to you know, pass on those higher costs. But they couldn't do that. And obviously on the flip side, as you've been mentioning, the, the two big juggernaut healthcare companies today just showing the strength of their franchise with CSL you know, upgrading. Plasma collections are up over 30%. So they've had a big hole in their earnings because plasma collections just nosedive during COVID. Um, they're, they're bouncing back pretty strongly. So that leaves a hole in their earnings that's probably going to close now. We're going to start seeing more more growth. So this stock's probably on a market PE a couple of years out, whereas some of the other stocks like Promedicus reported today a $60 million profit. Mm. The market cap's $7.2 billion. It's on 120 times earnings, which is, it's a great company, I get it, but it's got to double every year for, you know, five years to be on a market multiple. So I think, yeah, wheat from the chaff, very hard to read too much macro into it. It's mm. a, a bit like Treasury Wine Estates is interesting and in they've got you know, what they call luxury brands, which is Penfolds, which is mm. flying because all those, you know, older people that have got lots of money and no mortgages that are Back traveling. To the boomers. Yeah, they're traveling <laughs> to Positano and they're drinking Grange, right? <laughs> and then there's the rest of us who are, you know, trading down from $10 bottle to cask, which is what they call premium wine. So they're saying the premium wine margins are under pressure, but the luxury ones are going up. So look, obviously, Penfolds is a lot more important to Treasury Wine than the premium stuff is. It always has been, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so ninety percent of earnings. Yeah. In fact, the the company look at spinning penfolds off because they can get like a a Louis Vuitton sort of multiple on mm. that business. Mm. But they've decided to keep it all together. But it just shows you that you can't just look at the overall macro picture. You have to dive into which part of the economy you're servicing. And if you're servicing the you know the the young householder who's just got a mortgage, then you're in trouble. But if you're at the other end looking after the people who are going to Positano and drinking grains and you're doing okay, right? Like drugs, <laughs> that's what I say. Yeah. It, it's interesting, isn't it? It's not only different sectors, but I, it's, it, and I'm sorry, it's not in your notes, but a lot of um, commentators are starting to talk about like this rolling recession in the US, like a sector has rolled into a recession mm. and then it moves on a little bit. Maybe just transcribing that to back to Australia with these um, wage numbers that come out today. Mm. I mean, market took it as a pretty bullish signal. It decided to take off the Aussie dollar weaken momentarily until yeah. they decided that they probably hope China's going to stimulate more. But it, can we read too much into these yeah, wage there's numbers, probably Martin? probably a little bit of a head fake there, Danny, in that only 12% of the workforce actually had a change in wages during the quarter. And I think the next quarter, the one we're in now, is more like 50% of people um, are getting a wage change. And obviously we've had the Fair Work Commission uh, minimum Mm. wage, which is over eight. And the more importantly, the award wage, which is about 25% of the workforce, that's 5.75. So that's not in these numbers, right? So I think you really want to see the whites of the eyes of this number in the third quarter. So we won't get that till October, November. In fact, Michelle Bullock will probably be the next Reserve Bank governor by that stage. So these numbers today, they look okay, but they're a little bit backward looking. The wage pressure is really growing into this quarter. And it's like a lot of companies um, that have reported have sort of, um, we've seen relatively benign labour costs. Mm. And in some sectors, maybe that's not the case, but wage costs haven't really started to showing up there. So I think we want to be a little bit um, careful about judging this number as being, well, okay, there's no wage inflation, therefore the Reserve Bank's on hold. So the market's saying there's still a small chance of another hike, and that's probably going to be in November, not just because you've got a change of government, because you've got a lot more data that's going to come out between here and there, that um, it's going to make hard for the Reserve Bank to do anything in the September meeting, let alone October. So November's probably the live, the most live. So that's probably still ch- um, pricing in a 50% chance of one more rate hike. Interesting. Mm. What about China? We did get a, a cut to one of its key uh, rates, lending rates there today. Um, came just prior to what was some well, quite weak um, uh, economic figures for the month of July. I mean, obviously, you're, you're not there to tell us what's going to happen in the Chinese mm. economy, but you're mm. in the position you're going to have to make decisions uh, because of what's happening there. Yeah. How are you sort of in a, approaching it as, a, I guess, a, a portfolio manager? Yeah, I mean, the big question that we've got to think about is just iron ore stocks, really. I mean, yep. 17% of the market's made up of three companies that, that sell iron ore. So really have to think a lot about that. And the stimulus, which has long been uh, mooted, has not been aimed at, at the housing market. It's been more about, um, I suppose, staving off bankruptcies amongst developers, making sure that jobs get finished, 
but not necessarily stimulating more construction activity. It's probably trying to ease that sector through the pain that it's experiencing. Um, the reserve rate cut is obviously a welcome, um, a welcome development, and there have been a, about 100 measures since the 24th of July that have been announced. They're all tiny in nature, but cumulatively there's an impact. So I think, I think what um, China's trying to do is avoid a hard landing in its real estate sector rather than the typical 2008 stimulus where they just you know, uh, mm. threw lots of money at, at, at the property sector and there was a whole bunch of construction activity and oil price went nuts. I don't think that's what we're looking at. So we're, like everybody else, expecting the iron ore price to stay or, or to continue to trend lower and therefore we've got underweight positions in that, those iron ore stocks. Now because they're a big part of the index, that's a pretty big call to make to, mm. to be very underweight that sector, but we still feel comfortable with that view. Can we whirl over to the States? Because I'm just looking at the US 10-year Treasury yield, four mm. spot 219. It's getting pretty perky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of money that Treasury needs to raise and apparently those auctions are getting a little bit, well, soft and squishy, as it would suggest, yeah. with yields moving up. Bill Ackman's come out and shorted, you know, 30-year. Do you think, like I'm hearing 4.5% on the 10-year, and mm. whilst I'm not asking you to predict where it's going, do you think this is going to be the catalyst for this so-called correction that everyone's been waiting for? Yeah, the one, the, 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 the most anticipated recession <laughs> in world history. Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting, Danny, in that, look, the, the bond yields should be coming down, right? We've got better than expected inflation data in mm. the US. There's lots of goods deflation. Obviously, China's deflationary. Mm. Um, they're not seeing the wage pressure. Um, there's a little bit of industrial action here and there, but generally speaking, it looks like the Fed's winning the battle against inflation. The bond yields should be rallying. It should be in the mm. threes, the mid threes probably, based on where inflation expectations are. And yet here it is at 4.2 and rising. And you know we're about to go through the top, the double top there, right? So mm. it's all about supply, as you mentioned. So the Fed is unwinding its balance sheet at an annual rate of about six or seven hundred billion. Um, so that's a whole bunch of paper hitting the market. And then you've got the US government, which is trying to fund a current account deficit and a fiscal deficit of something like 12% of GDP. So it's flooding the market with bonds as well. And the, the market's just choking on it. And the release valve is the price. So we're just seeing higher and higher yields. Now that should be weighing on the market because a higher mm. bond yield means lower PE ratios. So we should be seeing PE ratios coming down. And yet we're seeing a lot of them go up because people are saying earnings are not as bad as we thought. We're paying higher and higher prices. So you kind of think something's got to give. Mm. The bond market's telling us to be very, very wary about, about earnings. And yet the equity market's saying, you know, we're quite bullish on things. So, you know, I just think investors need to have this on the back of their mind. While that, while that US 10-year bond yield's trading up, you're not going to make a lot of money out of the equity market. You really need to see that starting to come down and so you can get some PE expansion. And that's not happening at the moment. Mm. Well, we'll see if we get some sort of correction between now and the next time we chat, hopefully next week, Martin Crabb from Shore & Partners. We'll talk to you then. See you then. Okay, well, uh, let's just get over to the stock of the day. And, uh, well, we have spoken about CSL and Cochlear's results had a little bit of analysis too. But here is what our guest today had, has, has had to say today about both of those companies. Didn't really want to sell around the 308 mark prior to that dividend, but I sort of stuck to my stuck to the plan, and it's we we get another opportunity to buy back in. But I was pretty nervous given the downgrade. It's yeah. just very irregular for them to have yeah, a downgrade. Yeah. So, um, but you know they're uh, they've overdelivered, I suppose yep. again. But yeah, um, yeah. Okay. hopefully see a rally and a few broker upgrades. Maybe I think the price target is 328. I think consensus. Right. I dare say, uh, going into looking at the numbers today, I probably won't be selling again or at worst or worst case scenario I'll be trimming maybe at 310 but right. I think I'll probably carry them from this point onwards right. I think okay. they've got uh, good forward uh, mm. for growth okay Rude. well I'm definitely carrying them there's no mm. question yeah yeah um, yeah there's a few things um, I actually thought I mean I think today at the result I think you see that there's definitely some pressures happening at, at CSL and obviously we've seen that over the past over the past few months um, I mean, normally they, they over deliver. They didn't over deliver today, but I think the share price response shows you that market was just positioned for worse, basically. Mm. Yes. Taking into account that they, I mean, some people have this attitude like a profit warning never is on its own. That right. it was yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, times, right. three times bad, bad messages. Yeah, yeah. And that obviously hasn't you happened. You never buy into a downgrade cycle. Well, yeah. I mean, in CSL's case, you make an exception. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
So some interesting color there around, well, what is two of our, our, the mightiest stocks on the, on the ASX really, and probably in the past uh, higher quality companies too that well, a lot of uh, investors have liked because they're not a bank or a miner. Um, but I guess some mixed commentary there overall, good long-term prospects, but some just sort of, I guess, headwinds in the short term. Yeah, well, particularly for CSL, they yeah. really have been so heavily impacted by the pandemic. But um, yeah, I, th I, I don't know. I think the market looked at it as being pretty positive. But, yeah, you know, so. both, of the, both of those guys, they're not selling their stock. No, no, it's no. a long-term hold, but again, it was high, they weren't overly enthusiastic, perhaps, about the results themselves. Correct, um, which, yeah. Which might be the yeah. way to sort of yeah. characterise it. But, exactly. Um, anyway, let's, let's move on, um, and let's just talk about the leaders and laggards now, because while well, two of those names, or one of those names, I should say, will be on there. Oh, lake resources. Uh, yeah, um, so that was an update relating to, I think it's Karchi Mine? Yep. K-A-C-H-I. Um, we've Good. been sort of waiting with bated breath over a few days for that to sort of come through or more information to, uh, about that to be sort of filtered through. Um, and well, again, uh, you might get it, uh, across the engineering a, a little bit better no. than me, but um, nevertheless, a, a positive development there and we're starting to see something of a Successful extraction and injection tests at its flagship Karchi project. Well, sounds fancy. Um, GUZ Holdings up by 14.5%, Live360 up 12.6%, uh, Cochlear down there at uh, 5%, still a blue chip uh, name there, up 5%, so nothing to sneeze at. Let's talk, however, about the laggards. Seco, I would imagine, is probably going to be on there, and indeed it was, yeah. down by 5%. Uh, Pilbara off, actually mm. pulling back, was it at $5.30? Yes, days ago? yes, but you know, they were weaker yesterday, so yeah. some follow on selling there. I think though, I spotted on Twitter there's, um, well, A, there's um, price discounting starting again over there with Tesla, right. and also weakness in lithium prices. Yeah, okay, interesting. Zero a resource as well. Um, hitch in the secular trend. Oh, just a, a mere hitch, a mere <laughs> speed bump. Uh, Zero Resources also, uh, Rare Earth Play, uh, perhaps the biggest proxy locally for that, at least pure play, uh, down by 5.5%. But let's move on and get to what we're looking forward to over, actually sorry, there's the, the small caps, we'll uh, push through there because like we've already told the story, laggards in the small cap space as well, um, Melbourne Energy, not too sure what's happened there, but down 30% no. uh, for the day. Small cap stocks, they can do that. Um, but let's get to what's on overnight now mm. because it's actually reasonably interesting. Actually, Absolutely. that uh, UK job data would be out already. Um, so that, really? that, that hit, yeah, it comes out at 4 p.m. Um, at this I time can. of the year, which is, which is always nice. Mm -hmm. um, I can see that you're going to, to perhaps peruse uh, those numbers. But in the meantime, um, Home Depot is going to be the big one in terms of US earnings tonight. And that's going to be coupled with US retail sales. So I feel like we're going to be talking about the US consumer quite a lot tomorrow morning. Totally, um, and the, all the big uh, retailers in the US are reporting as well, Walmart, Home Depot, Yeah, Target. Home Depot tonight, Walmart's yeah. the next few days. Okay. Um, there we go. And yeah, Target as well, you, you mentioned. Um, yeah. There we go, you've got some breaking news So there. UK wages grew more than expected in the three months to June. Annual growth in regular pay, <sighs> excluding bonuses, a mere 7.8% the highest rate since records began in 2001. Wow. And economists had expected that were polled by Reuters between 7.3 to 7.4%. So that's pretty chunky monkey over there. They're in a world of pain in the UK, aren't they? The political economy around that is fascinating because as I understand it, so much of this is to do with the effects of Brexit, which in principle was to try and protect local jobs. <laughs> but we've got all these kind of trade-offs as, as always in, in, in economics. So yes. I don't know how you sort of carve that necessarily, but as far as monetary policy is concerned, it's obviously a, uh, Brexit well. Brexit the disaster. Yeah, well, anyway. Um, Sorry, Brexiteers. No, I sort of actually won't carry on um, about that. Uh, let's go to what's happening tomorrow, however. And uh, while well, the reports keep coming in thick and fast, Bapcor, Endeavour, in, yes, yes um, Mervac, Merv Merv and Telix, yes. and Ex-Dividend on CBA, Dicker Data and ResMed, yeah. and also the RBANZ decision. Yeah, no move expected, but I was looking at futures pricing today because you know I love looking at uh, what rates you markets do. are You're doing. You are such a nerd. Loser. Uh, <laughs> still implying uh, another hike to come from the RBNZ at least, but not tomorrow. Uh, the consensus call is for a 5.5% uh, cash rate in New Zealand um, that to, uh, to remain there, I should say. But that'll do it, I think. And just really quickly, oh, ASX 200 closed up 28 points. Hmm. 
at uh, or almost 0.38%, SIBO 200 up three points or 0.2%. So we'll take a green on screen day for this Thursday afternoon. Indeed, and it's just for the CBO 200 up 0.22%. Uh, as you probably gathered, it was an incredibly busy day today. It will be busy throughout the week as well, but there's a lot of great content, so you can catch up on that on the website and app. Otherwise, have a lovely evening, and we will see you again tomorrow morning.